Welcome everyone. I'm Trisha Edwards, Deputy Director of Smithsonian Affiliations, and I'm so pleased to have all of you with us today. We're glad to welcome you to our program, African American Women's Activism and Historical Perspective. This is the first in a series of programs we're hosting this month to recognize Women's History Month and to highlight and celebrate the contributions of diverse women throughout our nation's history. This program series is supported by the Smithsonian American Women's, Women's History Initiative, which creates, educates, disseminates, and amplifies the historical record of the accomplishments of American women. The Smithsonian wants the role of women in American history to be well-known, accurate, acknowledged, and empowering, and we at Smithsonian Affiliations are proud to be part of this effort. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to all of you today on land that once belonged to the Piscataway and Pamunkey. We honor these and other native lands, and we appreciate their continual stewardship by indigenous communities. I have a few housekeeping items to review. This program is being recorded. The link will be posted on the Smithsonian Affiliations YouTube page in the coming days. Closed captioning is available. Just click the closed caption button on your screen and captions will appear. If you have comments, please use the chat box. Be sure to send your comments to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your comments. And if you have questions for our presenters, please enter those in the Q&A box. You should see um, icons for both the chat and the Q&A in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Our staff will be monitoring both the chat and the Q&A. And please note that while on-topic discussion is encouraged, we ask that you express yourself in a civil manner and treat others with respect. The Smithsonian monitors comments and may remove participants from the program in accordance with its terms of use. A link to the Smithsonian's terms is in the chat for your reference. And finally, if you have a technical issue or a question unrelated to today's discussion, please use the raise your hand feature or type it in the chat box and a Smithsonian staff member will assist you. At Smithsonian Affiliations, we partner with museums and cultural organizations across the country to support them and their communities, people like all of you joining us today, while also furthering the Smithsonian's mission, the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Like the Smithsonian, our affiliate partners are committed to education and public service and, in work, and work in collaboration with us to catalyze essential, sometimes difficult conversations in their communities and to help us all better understand the world around us. This work seems more important now than ever before as we collectively grapple with so many big issues including the continued effects of a global pandemic, racial injustice, and political divisiveness, to name a few. Today's program is a great example of the ways in which the Smithsonian and our affiliates work together to bring thought-provoking, timely, and relevant content to audiences like you. With the help of affiliate organizations from New York to Texas, North Carolina to Oklahoma, and points in between, we're able to bring this program to many more people than we could with an in-person program in Washington, DC. And we're able to start a conversation not with one community, but across many. And we're serious about having a conversation. You can look for questions and prompts from us today in the chat, and we encourage you to share your stories, thoughts, and resources so we can all learn from one another. Smithsonian Affiliations is pleased to host today's program in collaboration with the National Museum of American History and the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities. While women like Stacey Abrams, Amanda Gorman, and the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tamendi may currently be top of mind when we think about African American women activists, the tradition, of course, goes back much further. Even before abolition, the fight for the right to vote, and the civil rights movement, Black women were using spoken word, entrepreneurship, and a diverse set of skills to organize and advocate for equality. We'll hear more about this tonight and learn how objects and artifacts from the Smithsonian's collection can help us in understanding this rich and important history. Now I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our featured speakers. Dr. Aliyah Brown is the Assistant Director of the African American History, Culture, and Digital Humanities Initiative at the Maryland Institute for Technology and Humanities, where she co-directs the Restorative Justice Project 
and leads research, training, and programmatic initiatives. Dr. Nancy Burkaw chairs the Division of Political History at the National Museum of American History. She also served as the lead curator of the Slavery and Freedom Exhibition at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Dr. Madupe Labode is a public historian at the National Museum of American History, working across two divisions, political and military history, and culture and community life. Her area of specialty is African American social justice history. And Dr. Crystal Moten is a curator of African American history in the Division of Work and Industry at the National Museum of American History, where she specializes in African American business and labor history. Dr. Moten will kick us off today and also serve as a moderator of the discussion. We've asked each of our colleagues to start off by sharing a few significant objects from the Smithsonian's collections, and afterwards we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. And now I'm delighted to turn it over to Crystal. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tricia. I am really excited to be here tonight to celebrate Women's History Month by exploring African-American women's activism in historical perspective. It's a great time to be working at the National Museum of American History, where we are in the process of adding to our collections in an effort to make the collections reflect the great diversity of the experiences of people who live in the United States. Part of that work also includes thinking about our collections in new ways. And so that's the perfect segue to what I want to talk about today. Next slide, please. So what do you see when you look at these objects? Who or what do they make you think of? Of course, Madam C.J. Walker, you see a can a pretty large size can of glossine and a pressing cone. Now recently, Madam CJ Walker has been in the media, especially because of a Netflix series that debuted actually this time last year that was roughly based on her life, or shall I say it was inspired by her life. Now, while the series received much criticism, one positive aspect of the series was that it focused on the community of Black women that surrounded Madge Madam C.J. Walker, as well as her life of giving. I like to look at the objects that you see on the screen as a way of thinking about what the potential of beauty was for African Americans. Another question, what did that container contain? And the series was called Self Made. Now, if we go to the next slide, you also see another image of glossine. And this is an image of a sample size of glossine, what might have been handed out in beauty salons or uh, pharmacies across the country so that people can get a sample of what the product was like in an effort to convince them to buy the product. But in thinking about Madam C.J. Walker and Glossine and the pressing comb, it's easy to just look at her as an individual person um, disconnected from her community. But in fact, that wasn't the case. And so for the rest of my time, I want to spend talking about another person who you may or may not have heard so much about, Marjorie Stewart Joyner. Next, please. Next slide, please. So, the story of Marjorie Stewart Joyner, and you can go back to the previous slide, slide please, is inextricably connected to Madam C.J. Walker, but Dr. Joyner's story neither starts or ends there. Joyner was born in 1896 in Monterey, Virginia to George Emanuel Stewart and Annie Stewart. Her parents divorced when she was young and as a result, she lived with various relatives in Ohio and Virginia. By 1912, she moved to Chicago to live with her mother. Now, while in Chicago, Joyner decided she wanted to become a beautician. And so she attended A.B. Moeller Beauty School and graduated in 1916, making her the first African-American to do so. 
She got her start with Madam C.J. Walker when her mother-in-law suggested and paid for her to take a course on the Madam C.J. Walker method. And this course was taught by Walker herself. Joyner finished that initial class and she took additional classes. And she also impressed Madam C.J. Walker with her own skills, especially because she had already been educated at a cosmetology school. Specifically, she impressed Madam C.J. Walker with her hair weaving techniques. And she shared this information with Madam C.J. Walker. And eventually she traveled with Walker and by herself teaching Walkers as well as her own hair techniques. After Walker died, the Walker Company named Joyner National Supervisor of Walker Schools. And the school had locations in Dallas, Tulsa, Chicago, Indianapolis, and New York, to name a few. Now, while her home base remained in Chicago, Joyner supervised these schools and she traveled extensively. Traveling on behalf of the Walker Company to train Black beauticians and sales agents, Joyner took advantage of Black church networks to spread the Walker technique. For example, the Baptist Church's annual conventions and access to community space provided Joyner with an opportunity to recruit new students and offer professional development opportunities for existing beauticians using the Walker method. Now, not only was Marjorie Stewart Joyner a leading educator with the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company, she also made a name for herself on the state level regarding beauty education. In the mid-1920s, Illinois became one of the early states to develop cosmetology code that regulated beauty parlors and beauty schools. Because of Marjorie Joyner's experience and her success as a beauty educator, she was one of only three women who helped write the state's beauty regulations. And in 1926, she became the first black woman licensed beautician in the state of Illinois. Joyner's success as a beauty educator continued in the 1930s, despite the devastating effects of the Great Depression. In fact, due to low enrollment in the early 1930s, Joyner designed a Walker Method mail-in beauty correspondence course that interested people can complete in order to open a shop in their home. Now, of course, this course was mostly sold outside of Illinois um, as other states did not yet have a cosmetology licensing code. So providing employment through beauty culture during a time when a majority of Black women worked in domestic service was one of the ways Joyner made an impact on Black women in both her local community and across the nation. Joyner's commitment to her local community and her organizing efforts were characteristics of both Black beauticians and beauty school owners. And this extended beyond the beauty field and into her hometown of Chicago. She helped to found Cosmopolitan Community Church. And then she also oversaw the Chicago Defender Charity Bureau. This recognition brought national attention. And during World War II, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt's administration tapped her to direct a center for Black servicemen in the city. Next slide, please. All her professional and community organizing experience primed her to create a professional beauty organization of her own, which she did when she established the Alpha Chi Pi Omega Sorority and the United Beauty School Owners and Teachers Association. Now, if anyone is familiar with the African American Greek organization tradition, Alpha Chi Pi Omega was founded in the tradition of African American Greeks. And the uh, organization was a sorority and had similar um, rituals and uh, things of their own. So the creation of these organizations was a direct result of her commitment to the field of cosmetology and her development to Black community development. Joiner's organization focused Black, school beauty, Black beauty school owners and professionals attention on national cosmetology policies and procedures. Joyner's success and determination attracted the attention of nationally known educator Mary McLeod Bethune, which I saw someone mention in the chat. Next slide, please. Who supported the establishment of the organization. Next slide, please. As a result of Bethune and Joyner's relationship, 
beauticians in the organization, formally supported Bethune Cookman College in Daytona, Florida, Daytona Beach, Florida, through considerable financial donations. Bethune Cookman College became one of the organization's prime philanthropic efforts. Joyner lived a long life. And in this photo, next slide, please, we see her with the late Mayor Harold Washington on the occasion of her 89th birthday in 1985. As I wrap up, the takeaway is that by examining Marjorie Stewart Joyner, we see the connection between beauty, politics, and activism, and they become astoundingly apparent. Now, other historians have written about these connections. They include Tiffany H. Gill, Julia Kirk Blackwelder, and I also talk about these connections in my forthcoming book, Continually Working, Black Women's Economic Activism in Postwar Milwaukee. Thinking back on the original photo where we begin the large can of Glossine and the hot comb, I want to end with the same question, slightly revised. Now, what do you see? Thanks so much for listening. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Madupe Lavodi. Thank you so much, Crystal. It is a great pleasure to be here today. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming and spending your afternoon and evenings with us. And a special thank you to the um, Colorado His History Colorado, um, which where I got my um, start as a public histo historian. Um, next slide, Pre, please. So today I would like to weave in the story of Nanny Helen Burroughs, along with um, how a museum comes to have an object of African-American and this African-American woman. Nanny Helen Burroughs may not be familiar to all of you, but she was familiar, she was a great friend of some of the women you've all, that my colleague, Dr. Moten has already mentioned. She was a colleague of um, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. And I know there's people here from North Carolina and she was also a great friend and colleague of Charlotte Gilman, uh, she, Charlotte Gilman Hawkins. I'm sorry, Charlotte Hawkins Brown. Get my Charlottes mixed up there. And so um, Nanny Helen Burroughs was born, like many, was born in Orange, Virginia, a very small town. Her parents had been enslaved and she as a child migrated to Washington DC, which was a migration that many people made before the great migration of going from rural areas to urban areas. She was a very talented student and graduated from the prestigious M Street High School. That high school still exists, it's now known as Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. And it was the first high school established for black youth because Washington DC, like many parts of the country was segregated. And this school was a, a, a high school for, for black children. Other parts of the country where there was segregation and no high school, black students often had to go to boarding school or simply couldn't go to high school at all. She was, after she graduated, she dedicated part of her life to the church which she was dedicated to, which was the National Baptist Convention. She worked in Louisville and also in Philadelphia before she returned in, in 1909 to Washington DC where she started her great effort, which was establishing the National Training School for Women and Girls. She founded this school and that ran from 1909 to 2006, long after her death. It was funded by black communities, something she was very proud of, of club women, of members of the, Net, of the BAP, National Baptist Convention. And it was specifically for, teen, for teenage girls and women. Nanny Helen Burroughs believed these women were the heart of not only the race, but also the people that would bear, that would, rec that would really make what America, what it should be. The training didn't refer to domestic work. Instead, it referred to helping women prepare to be business people in their own right. So she offered cosmetology, there was hat making, there was farming, anything for running a small business. And students came across, came to the Washington DC from across the United States, South America, Caribbean, and Africa. In other words, the African diaspora supported this. 
She was very, in addition to being very involved with her church and running the school, she was a public figure and an uncompromising advocate of equal rights for regardless of race or race or gender. She was a proud member of the National Association of Colored Women, was involved with the Republican Party, as were many African Americans of the time, but she was also deeply committed to economic justice. She created an organization called the National Wage Earners Association, which was specifically target, targeted to Black women who worked as domestics. This is a group of people that even today is very difficult to organize and advocate for their rights. She was also a um, she also was involved in various government age uh, panels and in advising the government in various forms, such as looking out for the Black women who had lost loved ones during the Great War, in other words, gold star mothers, and making sure that they were treated equally to white women who had lost their loved ones during the Great War. Her key phrase is what I have here, we specialize in the holy impossible. Nanny Helen Burroughs was used to having been underestimated as a black woman because of her race and because of her gender, because she was from the rural area and because some people underestimated thought that she wasn't as educated as she was. She knew that some people treated black women that in ways that they thought were not, that black women were not intelligent or black women were not capable. And so she and her colleagues really enjoyed proving people wrong, but more importantly, they enjoyed working for one another. So they kind of, this phrase, we specialize in the holy impossible is somewhat tongue in cheek, but I think it has a deeper message that what people could say is impossible isn't so when you work with others. Next slide, please. Her objects um, are, part of her objects are in the National Museum of American History's collections. We're really fortunate to have the, her objects there. And any object in a museum comes into a museum in a variety of ways. Sometimes they're donated, sometimes they are purchased, that doesn't happen that often, but sometimes um, people approach a museum and say they have something that matters and should be in the museum. A group of objects is usually referred to a collection and they're collected from related to the same individual. And this is a glimpse into the, um, in some ways to behind the scenes in the museum because it, it, it shows the, um, the collection card for some of her objects. And there's few things that I'd like to point out here. One is that, um, that her collection came into the museum in 1978, long after her death, and that the people who brought the collection there, Dr. Aurelia Downey and Ms. Violet Ancrum, were proudly associated with Nanny, the Nanny Helen Burroughs School, the name the Tra National Training School took after her death. Next slide, please. This is one of the objects in her collection, and it's a, a photograph of Nanny Helen Burroughs. She's on the front row on the left, and other women from the national that are associated with the Women's Auxiliary of the National Baptist Convention. If you were able to look at this more closely, you could see that all of them are wear, uh, wearing a very long ribbon over their heart, a blue ribbon that says Women's Auxiliary of the National Baptist Convention. This story might be relatively easy to decipher, but the next object I would like to show you might show a little bit, might be a little bit more difficult to say how it connects to Nanny Helen Burroughs and what stories can be told. So the next slide, please. This is a cash register. And if you went to our website, you could find out a fair amount of information about it. It was made by the National Cash Register Company, which is NCR. Um, there's also, uh, if you were thinking about what it is made of, you find out that it's made with brass and it's fairly fancy. Um, it has um, a lot of keys that have an internal mechanism and one of those will open the drawer where on the below it says national and again, kind of beautiful script. There is marble and on the um, kind of the shelf above the drawer. And most significantly, it says N.H. Burroughs on it. So this was Nanny Helen Burroughs' um, personal cash register. So cash registers are something that are probably so common, many of us don't really think of what they actually mean. 
But instead of being used in a business, this was being used as a teaching tool. Nanny Helen Burroughs wanted the women and girls who went to her school to understand how a cash register worked. She knew that they wouldn't have the opportunity to learn on the job, so they needed to come in with skills. The cash register also tells us a little bit more about, there's also other questions that we could ask about the cash register. What, why, who, was it something that she had commissioned for herself or was it a gift? What were the memories that people who went to, who learned on this cash register had? Did they use it in their business? Did they use those skills in businesses? What were the friends that were made, friendships that were made in the classrooms? These are, these are some of the questions that can be answered fairly easily. Like we can know what the objects, what the materials are, but other questions are much more difficult to answer. We can ask these questions out of curiosity, but also to build a picture of how and why this object, a cash register, register mattered to this person, Nanny Helen Burroughs. Nanny Helen Burroughs wrote a lot. Um, if you go to the Library of Congress, they, on their website, they say they have 134 feet of her writings and her um, business records. But she didn't write that much about herself. She was really much more oriented to writing about, um, about society and culture. So it is through the material culture objects, such as her Bible, her dictionary, her cash register, that we understand more about her. It is extremely rare for a general history museum to have objects related to a black woman activist in their collection. We often, families want to hold on to these items closely or often give them to a museum that is in their community. We, however, can take inspiration from these objects and take inspiration from Nanny Helen Burroughs Praise, who, encur who encourages us to specialize in the holy impossible. Thank you very much. And I'd like to hand this over now to Dr. Nancy Burkow. Thank you so much, Madupe. And I'd like to thank everyone who made this possible and for organizing us today. And for everyone out there, um, all the different affiliate museums, um, I wish that we could go and be with you in person. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about Black women's activism in the 19th century. So yes, actually before emancipation. Could I have the next slide, please? So when we usually think of activism, we think of this. We think of taking to the streets, voices raised, being your true self in all its fullness and complexity, and speaking truth to power. Next slide. But thank you. But when we look at the objects of the 19th century, uh, they seem to bear little resemblance to that kind of vibrancy. When we look at these objects, they look so demure, they look so quiet, and they look so tan. But what I would like to do today is to lift the veil of the past to see these objects with fresh eyes, because these objects are just as radical as the beautiful protests we witnessed today, and for many of the same reasons. These objects were not in the streets, but they were certainly in the public square, and they were speaking truth to power. And they really represented bodies that were being put on the line. So what can we learn from the few objects that survived this time period about the centuries long tradition of Black women's activism under slavery? Black women's activism has historic roots that stretches back over centuries. Just looking at slavery alone is 300 years of our nation's history from St. Augustine being settled in 1565 to emancipation in 1865. Yet only just a few objects remain for us to really unravel this history. But let's take a quick look through the collections of the National Museum of African American History and Culture to look at Black women's activism in free and enslaved communities. What slavery set in motion still resonates today. Slavery is the foundation of our republic. 
It is ground into the fabric of our society, and we still live with the afterlives of slavery today. Next slide. Thank you. So let's begin with Phyllis Wheatley. In the Slavery and Freedom Exhibition at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, we placed this small book, which literally is about the size of my two hands like this, alongside the Declaration of Independence, objects from Toussaint Louverture, Benjamin Banneker, Elizabeth Freeman. And side by side, they were all speaking to the fact that these are foundations of American expressions of freedom. So how is poetry activism? At its essence, poetry is an act of self-creation. It's manifesting an authority to really control one's own voice and to do it in a really layered and multifaceted way. As an enslaved girl, Phyllis Wheatley used the poetic form to speak out, but she did so at great risk because she was under the eye of her enslavers, of art patrons, and also publishers. So when she worked, she employed many different strategies. She employed the poetic conventions of the day, she also employed her race and also her assumed naivete because after all, she was just a girl and she used these to her own advantage. She was advocating for human rights in a time period when few people were really conceiving of rights granted to people based on their humanity. And she did this through layered speech. She used the language of political slavery, which everyone was willing to rail against the tyranny of political slavery, but she used it also to address chattel slavery. So she slipped the two in together under the noses of those uh, who she was communicating with. This was an act of courage, and we can see just how unsafe it was because when Phyllis Wheatley became free, she could never publish another book. No publisher would take her voice. So without that mantle of her enslaver and of the white patrons, she was unable to get her books into print. And she died of poverty at a very young age. Next slide, please. So when we were working on slavery and freedom, we had this small humble book. And like I said, it's precious and it was tan and we were trying to give it more life. We were trying to animate it. So we commissioned a cast figure of her and some of the other people who stood on that platform as the foundation of freedom. But what was amazing to me, and perhaps it shouldn't have been, that even though Phyllis Wheatley is a name that many school children know, and she's a figure that we is just, a, it's a name that floats around in our atmosphere. When we met with the designers and we asked them to create a figure, a statue of Phyllis Wheatley, they kept coming back with a completely different vision. Even though, can we go to the previous slide for just a sec? Look at Phyllis Wheatley right there on her frontispiece of her book. Look at who she is. Now let's go back to that other slide. What they kept giving us, even after looking at that portrait of Phyllis Wheatley, was really a figure of a stereotypical, of what the designer thought was a stereotypical enslaved woman, which was much like the figure of a mammy. And we went back and forth and back and forth several times. And I just want to mention this because I think that really our written history can be just as violent and cause harm as some of these things that these women faced and that they're facing them now, even um, many years past. Next slide, please. So speaking of representation, how people show themselves, how we think of them, how they're represented in popular culture, I'd like to turn to Sojourner Truth. Now, Sojourner Truth is another one of those names that everyone knows, yes? And what we know about uh, Sojourner Truth is that she had an amazingly powerful voice. She was a vivid presence who could command any stage at a time when women were not supposed to be on stage. 
The other thing I appreciate as a woman who's six feet tall is that Sojourner Truth was also six feet tall and was known as being a, a graceful and beautiful dancer. Now, when you look at this image of Sojourner Truth, um, you don't necessarily see these things within it. They're not necessarily reflected in this image. Now, this was a portrait that she went and sat for. So she controlled this image. She decided how she was going to be represented in this portrait. And look at how she decided to represent herself. She really is the very image of respectability. She's wearing a cap. She's wearing a shawl. She has needlework in her lap. And if you look at the way that she's dressed, she's literally covered her entire body that you cannot see anything except for her face and her hands. So she used to sell this photograph. Uh, it came with a phrase, which I think you can see underneath. I sell the shadow to support the substance. So even though Sojourner Truth was well known across the United States, she had trouble actually um, finding a roof to put over her head or even really keeping herself well fed. So in order to support herself on the lecture service circuit, she would sell this portrait. So this is also an act of self-creation and also an act for the mass market. And really the predominant audience was white abolitionists. So if you think once again, and if you look once again at Sojourner Truth in this portrait, you can see some of what she's facing. For one thing, I do once again think about her dress and the fact that she, as an African-American woman, would have been relatively, well, would have been unsafe moving across um, in any public space and even with private spaces because um, she would have always been subject and there certainly been the threat of sexual assault. So she could not move freely without the threat of violent repercussions. And also what you find is that she really, uh, once again, kind of the economic conditions of her life that she had to sell this portrait in order to support herself. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to turn to Harriet Tubman, and this is a much more personal object. So moving from the public objects, such as the book of poetry or the photograph that was used on the market, this is uh, Harriet Tubman's shawl that was given to her by Queen Victoria in 1895. What I find so important about people's clothing and about this shawl in particular is that when you see the shawl resting on the mount, as if it's resting on a person's shoulders, you can actually see the body, the imprint of Harriet Tubman herself. And one thing, I hope you all have the pleasure of having seen this or being able to see it in the near future. One thing I'm always struck with is what a tiny person she was for being so completely powerful. But the one thing that objects really have taught me is that when you're standing in the presence of an object that belonged to, to Harriet Tubman or anyone, you see a collapsing of time and space. That object lived then, wrapped around her shoulders, and it lives right now, right in front of you. And I think that this is something uh, that has made me as a historian really wrestle with the power of the past within the present. So I'd like to look at a few more slides of Black women's activism, but from less well-known figures. Oh, and there's Mary Tubman. Um, this is a child skirt, and it was worn by Lucy Shirley when she was about four years old. She was born into slavery in Loudoun County, Virginia, which is just right across the river from Washington, D.C. And this skirt has faded quite a bit over time. But um, when you look at it really closely, you can see the original fabric, which was really, um, the cream was much more rich and the flowers were just sparkling with all these different colors. The skirt is also really carefully crafted 
And I don't know if you can see, but I'm pointing to my screen, but I can see all these tiny little pin tucks that someone pin tucks the entire hem of this skirt. Uh, you can also see that the waist has been let out and the hem has been dropped. So it was really worn by Lucy over a number of years of her life. But what this really means to me about Black women's activism is really the love that went into that skirt. And somebody who loved Lucy Shirley made that for her. And in making it for her, celebrated her and celebrated the beauty of her spirit. And even though Lucy Shirley could have been sold away from her family, sold away from her mother, there was always this act of communication for this child of how dearly loved she was by someone else. And I think that that's um, a, a part of Black women's activism. Next slide. I think joy is also something that contemporary activists really call on us to recognize that joy is also just essential to activism. And you can certainly see this in the objects of the past. So this is a wedding dress. And we don't actually know the name of the woman whose dress this was, but we do know that she made it for her wedding. And when we examine the dress, once again, turning it inside out, we can see that it was, it was made from a very narrow strip of fabric. And that to get all of those stripes absolutely perfect, the person was really a master craftswoman in order to make those seams seamless so that you could just see this perfect dress. And once again, this woman was enslaved. So when she was married, according to law, that marriage would not have remained in place. It could be shattered and destroyed at any time. But for her wedding, she celebrated her beauty and she celebrated her love by crafting this dress for herself. And I'd like to close with one last picture. So this also, I think, is a, a strain in Black women's activism. So these three women, right after emancipation, because you can tell because of the dresses that they're wearing, they went out and had their picture taken together. We don't know who they are. Are they sisters? Are they cousins? Are they friends? One thing we know is that it was important enough for them to all go down to the photograph studio and have their pictures taken together. So I think with the various objects that I've shown you tonight that we can see some of the genealogy of the movement for Black Lives. We can see the love, we can see the joy, and we can see the fact that when people wake up in the morning, they can feel their freedom. But we can also see um, with many of the objects that I've shown you here tonight, that it was a world where you had to say and where you still have to actually say out loud, you cannot take it for granted that Black Lives Matter. So now I'd like to turn this over to Aaliyah Brown, who's going to be speaking about quilting. Hello. I first want to start with a moment of gratitude. Um, I'm so grateful for my interlocutors, Dr. Moden, Dr. Labode, and Dr. Burkhaw, um, and the Smithsonian affiliates for organizing this event. I'm so grateful to have a space where we can pay close attention to Black women's political material and aesthetic lives. So I just want to offer that moment of gratitude. So first, for me, COVID-19 has prevent, presented ways to get reacquainted with the quilts in my home. I'm spending much more time with them, and they also sometimes have a life that extends beyond my home to virtual meeting spaces. So for example, Carol Gary Staples, the Black Madonna, um, if you all can see hanging right behind me, has been part of my family's collection for some time. 
It's a piece of fiber art with an applique black Madonna and child with yellow and gold orbs over their heads. And while it's a contemporary quilt, this textile work belongs to the tradition of pictorial quilts used to express Black pride, encourage um, consciousness raising, and also as a space for working out political thought. In other words, when we pay close attention to Black women's textile making, designing, and manipulating, we can start to see how they imagined and enacted freedom over time. But this history is not easily surfaced because of the maker's own dissemblance for their protection. Institutions um, sometimes narrow collecting practices and a complicated mat matrix of a whole host of other reasons. If we are diligent and persistent, we can piece together seemingly disparate materials from eclectic archives to see how community organizing has guided Black women's engagement with textiles. So for the first uh, textile that you'll see here is where I like to start this exploration at the, with the National Association of Color Women's Clubs banner, uh, which is in the collection of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Along with the rich purple silk and the gold fringe, the noticeable part of this banner is the organization's mission statement in large gold letters, lifting as we climb. We don't know who made this particular banner, but we do have photographic documentation of women host, hoisting banners like this into the air or displaying them at club meetings. The core of the power in this object comes when we consider the historical context that Black women who lived in during what many historians have termed as the nadir of race relations in the United States. Um, so essentially during this incredibly risky time during lynching and so forth, these Black women had the audacity to bring the notion of racial uplift that had proliferated in interior spaces, but they brought it to the public by showing these banners. Next slide, please. So club women used banners and embroidery to advance the race, um, as my interlocutors also mentioned earlier. But this next set of women used quilting to grapple with gender roles, ideas of cooperative economics, and even seedlings of the tenets of Black power. So Ruth Clement Bond and the wives of Willard Dam workers organized a sewing bee to document the Black workers' role in bringing power to the region. The two quilts here are in the collection of the Museum of Art and Design. In an oral history with the Association for the American Foreign Services Worldwide, Ruth Clement Bond recalled, quote, our first quilt we call Black Power, and that's the one that you'll see on the left. Um, the quilt showed a bolt of lightning signifying power held in the hand of a Black worker. We are attempting to use our handcraft to express the part that the Negro is playing in changing the South, end quote. To be clear in mapping out the trajectory of Black women's textile work, this moment is when Black women start to experiment with the structure of the quilting bee as a way to gain economic independence. Um, so essentially they would make artistic quilts like the ones that you see, but they would also make utilitarian wares um, and sell them for their own kind of um, economic gain. I want to note that this type of thinking and language is percolating in the quilting bee long before Stokely Carmichael's declaration of Black power. Um, so it's something that you know is not often credited with Black women, but they were thinking about these progressive notions of how do we have power for our communities. Next slide, please. So following along this trajectory of Black women's textile work, we arrive at a point where dominant narratives of civil rights, Black histories have often failed to acknowledge the work of Black women textile cooperatives. More popular histories surface when women 
like Fannie Lou Hamer and many of us are familiar with her televised testimony at the 1964 Democratic National Convention. Most folks are not as familiar with the clusters of Black women in Mississippi, Tennessee, and Alabama who were animated by the same issues of poverty, education, voting rights, and women's rights, but they organized in a different way. Some women organized workers' cooperatives with the help of SNCC and CORE, and um, I'm not sure if you can see the documents, but these two documents are correspondence um, from women who were one attempting to get into the workers' cooperative, and then the larger one is a woman kind of thanking SNCC for helping her start the workers' cooperative because it essentially um, kind of changed the, the, direct, the direction of her community by being able to bring in that income. And one of the most successful cooperatives during this time was the Freedom Quilting Bee that originated in Rehoboth, Alabama. This bee offered Black women a place where their work and politics could align. Some of the women came to the bee after being blacklisted for participating in marches or demonstrations for the right to vote. Um, the bee provided these women with the um, income as they were able to continue their activism. It also had a very important place for safety. Um, after some women had experienced sexual assault as in their previous job as day laborers. And historian Danielle McGuire covers this history in her book at the dark end of the street. Next slide, please. So I want to conclude this brief talk with sharing the story of Fannie Lee Cheney. After a long struggle resisting the Ku Klux Klan, chronic illness and poverty, Fannie Lee Cheney died in Willingsboro, New Jersey in 2007 as an obscure figure. Contrarily, her son James Cheney and Congress of Racial Equality, Philip Workers, Skitman and Schwerner, live on in the American imagination as civil rights martyrs. After she discovered what the Klan had done to her son, she went on epic crusades crisscrossing the state of Mississippi to speak at different demonstrations. She was so outspoken about her son's death and the problem of white land ownership that employers blacklisted her. Nights after defending her home from bullets and a burning cross, eventually forced her to leave Mississippi. While Mrs. Cheney does not have the archive of a person who has engaged in decades on end with labor and civil rights struggles, the material of her legacy appears in the provenance of her quilts. Women of Color Quilters Network founder, Dr. Carolyn Maslumi and members Ed Janetta Miller and Peggy Hartwell collected Mrs. Cheney's quilts as part of the network's mutual aid program and conducted oral histories with her. So ironically in the 1980s, the Women of Color Quilters Network engaged in an act of recovery or recovering a lost history, although she was actually still alive, um, but she was already becoming absent from the histories of the Southern freedom movement. So I'll conclude this by saying, and reiterating that Black women have documented history, use their creative work as socioeconomic engines to imagine and enact freedom. They've also tended to these histories, making sure that we also imagine otherwise, whether we are in our homes or at museums. And thank you. Thank you so much to Madupe, to Nancy, to Aaliyah for your rich presentations. I mean, we've learned so much just from hearing what you have to say, both about the objects and the context in which the objects were used or created, et cetera. Um, as we kind of wrap up our time together, we only have a short amount of time left. And so what I wanted to do was pose one question that we could all kind of think about and answer together. 
As I was listening to your presentations, I did notice a common thread, especially as we think about material culture and African-American women's activism. And that common thread was, we either don't have a lot of information or we don't have a lot of objects related to either the person we're studying or the activism they were engaged in. And so my question revolves around what the impact of that lack of information or those lack that lack of objects or information, what kind of impact does that have on the stories we can tell, one, um, and then also what we know and what we can do in the present in thinking about Black women's activism. So that's a big question. You can take any chunk of it that you'd like, but basically what are the implications for the record and the archive being in the state that it is for Black women's activism, both our understanding of it and our uh, seeing it today? Um, I'll jump in. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal, for such an amazing question. Um, I would say is that there's some humility that museums need to engage with, is that even though there is not the, that the National Museum of American History may not have, an, have black, enough Black women's objects in it, it needs to engage with, understand why that might be the case. So um, we have stories of, um, Black women, um, for example, wanting to, a Black woman wanted to dedicate, de, um, to donate the objects associated with the Black, the first Black man who won the Congressional Medal of Freedom. And a curator in the 1940s took the uh, medal, but refused to, to take anything else. And so we really have to thank Michelle Gates Morrissey for bringing that story to the, to the fore. So we need to think about if our museums are doing the same thing today. Um, and I feel, because I think that we're, that there is a very strong tradition of history making in the, the, dias, the African diaspora. And I think that predominantly that a majority of museums need to learn how to listen to that. Thank you, that's great, that's great. I agree with that point, um, Dr. Labode. I think the other thing that I'll add, and this is something that I mentioned in my presentation, what Black women's history calls for is um, looking at an eclective archive. And that's a term that uh, Dr. Tanisha Fuller um, has used in her work. And by that, I mean an archive that expands beyond the traditional um, for a corner building that we think of as repositories. And it so it also calls for us to think about the different materials that Black women make, um, where they're housed. It calls for us to develop relationships. Uh, and this kind of goes back to what Madupe was mentioning earlier. But there's so much rich history in Black women's experiences. Um, and it's found in basements, it's found in closets, it's found in um, hairdressers and so forth. But I, I say all that to say is it, as historians, public historians, curators, you, folks who are interested and care about Black women's history, what it calls for us to do is be creative about how we look for and interpret history, um, rather than simply and solely looking at the written word. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And um, I know when working at African American History and Culture was starting a collection from scratch and people really didn't feel that we would be able to uh, make slavery manifest um, in that whole time period. But it's exactly what you're saying. I mean, people have held on to their histories, but there's a good reason why people haven't let go of those histories. And I always think of how um, Harriet Tubman's shawl actually came into the collection. And it was because of Dr. Charles Bloxon. And, uh, you know, he had the great African American library up at Temple University. And, um, you know, we would always have to go and make a pilgrimage to Dr. Bloxon. And he started that collection because 
he couldn't actually find material on African American history and so began just collecting books and after a while became known throughout the Northeast as a person who you could trust your possessions with. So when Harriet Tubman's family was looking for a home for her possessions, they took them to Dr. Bloxon. And I think, you know, that's true of institutions, uh, but it's also true of people and families. And, um, but really the question is whether or not museums have had such harmful practices over time about whether or not they can secure the trust um, to really increase our knowledge. I mean, that. And I, I, I'm not sure if you are going into the fact that like we have to question our principles of provenance um, and the way that they're defined now, and we have to really stretch and expand them and really respect the knowledge that's coming um, from communities and individuals. Yeah, thank you. I was thinking about many of those those points that you all just raised, but also thinking about the expansiveness of Black women's activism and our, our attempts to understand, um, to collect, to curate, um, has to be just as expansive as their activism, both uh, mm -hmm. past, present, and I would venture to say the future, even though historians, we don't like to deal with the future. So um, thank you for answering that one question and thank everyone for attending. I am going to throw it back over to Trisha now. Uh, thank you, Crystal. And thank you, Aaliyah and Mandupe and Nancy. This was such a wonderful program and a great way to start our women's history program series. Um, thank you all so much for sharing your expertise and your wisdom and the Smithsonian collections. And thank you, of course, to my affiliations colleagues for helping do all the behind the scenes um, to make tonight happen. And thank you mostly to our audience for tuning in and the wonderful chat and the conversation and the comments. Um, it was incredible. So it was almost like two programs in one. Um, so we hope you'll be able to join us next week for another great discussion about Lena Richard and Julia Child, um, two women who changed culinary history. Um, thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. <laughs>